What's going on guys, my name is Matt and today I have another PC build for you. This time the price point is $1000 and this is going to be a full build guide. Not only am I going to be showing you each of the parts and talking about why I picked them, but I'm also going to show you how to put this system together step by step and show you how it performs in a bunch of games. This video is made possible by today's sponsor Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Now returning to the topic of the video, for $1000 you're getting a compact and portable ITX PC that looks and performs great. This is a super well rounded system and is great for gaming, streaming, and even video editing. While there are obviously tons of different ways you could have spent this budget, I went with parts I know are quality that will work well together and will last you a long time. I went off of pricing from Amazon and Newegg and I'll have all the links to these parts in the description below. This is an ITX PC build so it's not going to be quite as good priced to performance as traditional ATX or micro ATX PCs. This is because of a few parts, but still this system performs amazingly in any game you throw at it. Also, this system has a handle so it's pretty portable and perfect for a LAN party rig. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the parts that make up this $1000 gaming beast. Right now, if you want a powerful CPU at a great price, then in most cases you're going to get a Ryzen CPU. With AMD's latest line of Ryzen chips, we saw a huge boost in performance compared to the previous generation. The CPU I went with is the current king of of price to performance gaming CPUs which is the Ryzen 5 3600. This is a 6 core 12 thread CPU which can boost up to 4.2 GHz. This is pretty fast for stock speeds but the cool thing is the CPU is unlocked so if you want you can overclock it. I didn't overclock it for this video but if you're interested in squeezing some extra performance out of your system then I'll link a Ryzen overclocking guide in the description down below. Like I said before this is a 6 core CPU with multi threading making it not only a beast for gaming but also a very good chip for streaming and even video editing. Overall, for $185, the CPU is impossible to beat and I have zero hesitations recommending it for any mid-range gaming PC. Another thing that makes the CPU a great value is the fact it comes included with a pretty decent stock cooler in the box. This is the Wraith Stealth Cooler, which is somewhat basic, but it looks good in my opinion and certainly gets the job done. While this is a smaller cooler, surprisingly this little guy can actually handle a mild overclock which is great to see and is something I've done in the past. Upgrading to a better CPU cooler in the future is definitely something to consider, but for now this works great especially at stock speeds. In terms of the motherboard, because this is an ITX system we'd need an ITX board for the CPU to slot into. ITX motherboards are generally more expensive than their micro ATX and ATX equivalents which might seem counterintuitive because it's a smaller board and needs less materials, but in reality the engineering that goes into fitting everything into a small board is what causes the price to be a little high. What I went with is the ASRock B450 ITX slash AC. This is, in my opinion, the best value for the money ITX AM4 board on the market. I ran the B350 version of this board in my personal rig for well over a year and had no problems whatsoever with it. It has a logical connector layout, decent back IO, and an M.2 slot for M.2 drives. One downside of an ITX board is only having two RAM slots, but that's not really a deal breaker for me. The color scheme is pretty neutral, and subjectively I think this is a good looking board that you could pair most parts with and it won't clash visually. For around $120, this is a fair bit more than the B450 micro ATX boards I usually go for, but in terms of an ITX board, it's a decent deal and is a quality board that I highly recommend. Moving on to RAM, this is a place where you need to pay close attention when building a Ryzen system. Ryzen CPUs rely heavily on fast RAM to get the best performance possible, so this is definitely not a place to cheap out. While I normally recommend 3200 MHz kits for budget builds, in this instance I opted for a 3600 MHz kit to get the most performance possible. This is a 2x8 GB kit of Corsair Vengeance LPX RAM. Now the sticks you see in this video are 3200 MHz, but I priced the system with and linked the 3600 MHz version of of this RAM below, I just use this because this is what I had on hand. So keep in mind the FPS you'll get in games will be even higher than what I show in the benchmarks because you'll have the faster version of this kit. 16GB is plenty for any modern game and is even enough to do a lot of other tasks. Stuff like streaming to Twitch and video editing both work well on 16 gigs of RAM. If you're wanting to do heavy video editing, going for a 32GB kit might be a good idea, but the reality is I use 16GB of RAM to edit my videos in 4K for many months before I decide to upgrade, so even 4K 
editing is possible on 16 gigs of RAM. Not ideal, but it is possible. Moving on to the graphics card, this is where a big chunk of the budget went because the GPU is the biggest determining factor in how a system will perform in gaming. I budgeted around $300 for a card and had options from AMD and Nvidia around this price point. After looking at what was available and considering driver support, I decided to pick up an Nvidia RTX 2060. The 2060 is a great card for 1080p and 1440p gaming. Also it has ray tracing cores built in so if you want to try out ray tracing and not take a huge performance hit, then you'll have the option because this is an RTX card. The model I went with is the EVGA KO Edition. This is one of the more affordable versions of the RTX 2060, but it performs great and doesn't look half bad either. It has 8GB of video memory which is more than enough for modern games and will be adequate for many years to come. This version also has a backplate which is nice to see. Subjectively, I think this is a good looking card and it worked great in this build. Moving on to storage, this is a place where I spent a lot of time deliberating about how much I should budget and what drive or drives I should get. What I ended up doing is getting a combination of an SSD and a hard drive. The SSD I went with is a 256GB NVMe drive in the M.2 form factor. NVMe means that it connects directly through PCIe lanes and because of that NVMe drives tend to be very very fast. This Enlin Premium SSD is a budget NVMe option, but it still offers great performance. This SSD will be reserved for your OS, applications, and a few of your most played games. Keeping your OS and applications on an SSD versus a traditional hard drive will make the computer boot up faster, load programs faster, and just feel snappier overall. At around $40, this is a decent deal. Prices fluctuate all the time, so I'll leave a few options for SSDs in the description below. Now this drive is great and all, but 256GB isn't that much space, and if you're spending this much on a system, you should have a good storage solution. Because of this, I also budgeted a 2TB 7200RPM mechanical hard drive from Seagate. This will give you plenty of space for a moderately large game library, and will allow you to hold other large files like movies. At around $50, this drive is a good deal and gives you a ton of storage for the money. Please note the hard drive you're seeing is just a visual placeholder and is not the same drive that is in the official parts list. This combination of an SSD and a mechanical hard drive is what I would recommend, but if all you need is one terabyte of storage, then taking the SSD and hard drive budget plus $10 will get you a one terabyte SSD. This may be more ideal for those of you who want everything on an SSD, but again, for a good long-term solution, you can't go wrong with an SSD and hard drive combo for great value for the money. Moving on to the power supply, this is another place where we have to pay the quote-unquote ITX tax. The case I went with only supports SFX power supplies, which if you haven't seen are surprisingly small compared to full ATX units and are relatively expensive for the wattage you're getting. Again, this is due to the increased complexity of designing and manufacturing a high quality unit that is this small. There seems to be two standard wattages when it comes to SFX PSUs, and those are around 450 watts and around 600 watts. Now we could have gotten away with a 450 watt unit, but I decided to opt for a 650 watt one to make sure there's enough headroom for even a very high end GPU. I went with what is in my opinion the best value for the money SFX unit on the market, which is the EVGA Supernova 650 GM. Like the name implies, this is 650 50 watt 80 plus gold power supply and it comes in at around $100. It's fully modular and offers comparable quality to the Corsair and Seasonic options at considerably lower prices. The 650 watts is way more than enough for this build and using this guy worked great. I don't really like the style of cables this comes with but that's more of a personal preference and overall I have no problem recommending this unit to go into your next small form factor build. Finally let's go ahead and talk about the case. This isn't the smallest ITX case ever and it's not perfect, but the Lian Lee TU150 is a pretty great case to work in. It's all aluminum with gorgeous brush panels in either silver or black and has a large tempered glass side panel. Cable management is kind of tough in this guy, but I was able to get this looking pretty neat. This case looks pretty minimal and refined. Again, for an ITX case, it is kind of big, but for $110, this is a pretty decent deal for a premium aluminum ITX enclosure, especially when you compare it to other premium ITX enclosures like the Ghost S1, which sells for well over $250. All of the panels are toolless and are easy enough to take off, but still feel very secure when they're attached. And one of my favorite features is the pop-up handle. This makes 
makes it very easy to transport your PC, which some people do on a regular basis. This isn't a great case for a system you're going to fly with, but if you want something you can easily carry to and from work or to and from LAN parties, then the handle on this TU-150 is a very welcomed addition. I also like that it retracts and leaves the system looking super clean when the handle is put away. Overall, if you're looking for a very small case, this isn't it, but if you want to downsize from a big ATX case and want something premium, then I can definitely recommend the Lian Lee TU-150. With this being said, the case doesn't come with any fans, so you need to supply your own. What I went with is a 5 pack of these up here RGB fans that include a remote and a controller. These can only be controlled by the remote, and as far as I can tell there is no way to control their speed. This makes the system audible at idle, but it isn't annoyingly loud in my opinion. There are tons of different RGB fan kits on Amazon, so pick one you like and one that fits your budget. I use 4 of the 5 fans and in my opinion they look great. There are tons and tons of effects to cycle through, and yes you can set them to static colors or even turn them off if you choose. Four fans also allow for really good temps, which you'll be able to see in the benchmark section towards the end of the video. Overall, for $1,000, you're getting a powerful system that looks and performs amazingly. Now that you've seen each of the parts and understand why I picked them, I'm now going to transition to this step-by-step -step guide on how to put this PC together. I'm going to show you from start to finish how to put this PC together, which should be helpful for anyone wanting to build this PC or anyone who just wants to know how to put together a system in general. There are a number of ways and orders to assemble this PC, but I'll go over my preferred method. Before you get building, it's important to make sure you're ready by gathering the right tools and have an open area to work on. The only thing you'll really need is a standard Phillips head screwdriver and a smaller Phillips head screwdriver for the M.2 screw. I would highly recommend you use a magnetic screwdriver, this will make building the PC a little bit easier and can be helpful in a number of ways. Next, let's talk about static. I personally don't worry about it and have never had any issues or problems with it. If you live in a very dry place or are worried about it, you can use an anti-static ground strap like this one or periodically ground yourself on something like a light switch screw. With your workspace ready to go, your schedule clear, and your tools in hand, it's now time to start building your PC. Start by grabbing your motherboard box and opening it up. Go ahead and take out the motherboard itself. The SATA cables, the IO shield, the M.2 screw, and the Wi-Fi antennas if you plan on using Wi-Fi with this system. Take the motherboard out of the bag and put it on the box. To get the board ready for our CPU and cooler, take out these four screws and lift these two plastic pieces away. With your CPU out and ready to go, push down, out, and pull up on this metal lever so it's sitting perpendicular to the board. Take your CPU, handling it only by the edges, and line the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard. Lower it into place, applying no force, and lower the metal arm back down into place. I've used the CPU before, so I needed to apply thermal paste, but your cooler will come with paste pre applied so no need to add your own. You can now take your cooler and line up the screws with the standoffs in the back plate and lower it into place. Screw each corner a few rotations at a time going in a cross pattern until it's tightened down. Next, take the CPU fan connector and plug it into the header labeled CPU fan 1. There's a notch in the connector and the header. Line them up and press it into place. You can next optionally hide the fan cable under the cooler shroud. You can now bring your attention to the two RAM slots on the board. Open up both slots and get out your RAM sticks. Lower the first stick down, lining the notch in the stick up with the notch in the slot. Once lowered in, you can go ahead and push it in until both ends click. Do the same for the second stick. Now flip your board upside down, resting it on the cooler, and get out your M.2 SSD. At an angle, line the notch in the SSD with the notch in the slot, and press it into place, then swing the other end down. Hold it in place while you install the small M.2 screw we took out of the motherboard box earlier. Once this is done, you can grab out your case, take it out of the box, and remove the foam and plastic. Remove each of the panels by popping them out one at a time. They should pull straight out, and you should have removed four panels in total, three metal ones, and one tempered glass panel. You can now grab out the parts bag and free the front panel connectors. Laying the case on its side, take the I.O. shield like this and lower it into the I.O. cutout. Press in all four corners, which should click into place. This is kind of annoying, but just make sure it's secure in place. You can now lower the board down I.O. first. Use the I.O. shield and standoffs as guides so you know everything everything's lined up correctly. Now take four of the motherboard screws that look like this, and screw one into each hole in the motherboard. Once this is done, our motherboard is installed. Now turn your attention to the power supply, pull out the PSU itself and the cables. 
Line it up like this with the fan facing down and screw it into place using the four screws that came with the power supply. You need to hold the PSU in place while you do this. You can now plug in the power supply pass through cable. We're now going to install our fans. Open up the fan box and pull out four fans, the controller bag, the foam pads, and the screws. I started with the back fan, routing the fan cable to the back and lining it up like this. Then I installed four fan screws from the back. Now pop the front dust cover off, route the cable to the back, orient the fan like this, and secure it with four screws. For the bottom two fans, we're going to use the foam pads. Pull these foam pieces off like this and apply two per corner on the side that says up here. This spaces the fans from the metal grill and keeps them from rubbing. Now with this up here part of the fan facing the bottom of the case, install both of the fans with four screws each. Now get your hard drive and take one rubber piece and screw that looks like this and install one in each bottom hole of the hard drive. The hard drive pressure mounts into place like this, but before installing it, plug in a SATA power cable from your power supply box that looks like this and route it out of this hole. Now you can take your drive and put the screws up in the big holes and slide them forward to lock the drive into place. Now take your USB 3 cable and route it through here. Then do the same thing with the small front panel connectors. Next take the HD audio cable and route it through here. Leave the USB-C cable in the back because our motherboard doesn't support it. Flip the case onto its side and plug the HD audio into the port labeled audio to the bottom left of the cooler. Line the pins on the board with the holes in the connector and press it into place. For USB 3, line the notch in the connector and header then press it straight into place. Now referring to the motherboard manual, plug in the front panel connectors one at a time. This can be annoying to do but just take your time. We can also now plug in a SATA cable into the SATA header like this. Next route the cable through the back and up to the drive and plug it in. You can do this before installing the drive but it wasn't too difficult for me to do it after the fact. Now take out your 24 pin cable, 8 pin CPU cable, and your PCIe power cable. Line the two notches up for the 24 pin and press it into place. Next do the same thing for the 8 pin cable, pushing the two pieces together, then line the notches up and press it into place. These cables are very short so we have to route them directly to the power supply. Plugging the 24 pin cable into the section labeled MB and the 8 pin cable into the section that says CPU. You can now route the SATA power cable that we used before to the front and plug it into the SATA section. Finally plug in the PCIe power cable into the power supply and route it down into the main chamber. We are now ready to install our graphics card. Unscrew this retention bracket and lift it away. Next unscrew the top two PCIe slot covers and remove them but keep the screws handy. Push open the PCIe lock and then grab out your graphics card. Line the notch in the card with the notch in the slot and once lined up press it into place. The PCIe lock from earlier should click closed. Once in, you can reinstall the two screws and the retention cover. Now take the PCIe cable and plug one of the 8-pin connectors into the graphics card. You line up the notches on both and just press it into place. I use one of the AVGA Velcro straps to neaten up the unused connector. Now with the case back on its side, get out the controller that came with the fans. Plug the fans into it one by one, they can take a fair amount of force to press in. Then take the SATA power end of the controller and plug it in the same SATA power cable the hard drive's connected to. I initially did this behind the motherboard tray, but it made the build look better by keeping the controller in the top section here. Next, just neaten up the cables with any twist ties, zip ties, and velcro straps you have. Now all that's left to do is make sure the PSU is flicked on and push each panel back into place and the system is ready to be powered on for the first time. You can also do the plastic peel, but be smarter than me. Now that you've completed the build process, you still need to do a few things before you can start gaming. The first is to install Windows. I'm not going to put a guide in this video on how to install Windows, but I'll link one in the description below. Once this is done and Windows seems like it's up and running fine, we need to install a few drivers. The first being the motherboard drivers. Head to the link in the description which takes you to the motherboard webpage and download the all-in-one driver and install it. Once this is done, you need to install the graphics drivers. Click the link in the description to the NVIDIA website and download the 2060 drivers and then install them. Once this is done, there are only a few more things that need to be done. First, if your hard drive isn't showing up, put in the search bar create and format and click the first link. 
find the drive that says unallocated storage, right click and hit create new simple volume, just name the drive and keep clicking next and you'll now be able to access your drive. Finally, restart your system and as it starts back up, smash the delete key repeatedly. This will bring you into the BIOS. Go to the OC tweaker, click auto under XMP setting, then select XMP profile one. Then just save changes and exit. This will ensure your RAM is running at its rated speeds. Once this is done, you're ready to download and get into some games. So now that you've seen the parts and how to put this system together, we're ready to move on to the benchmarks. But before that, I want to take a few seconds to talk about today's sponsor, Squarespace. I've been a user of Squarespace long before they were a channel sponsor. A while back when I had a business making and selling custom 3D printed phone cases, I used Squarespace because they did and still do have, in my opinion, the best e-commerce system available. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that handles all of the confusing aspects of creating a website beyond just design with stuff like SEO tools and a really robust set of analytics. If you're doing business online, you need a website and Squarespace offers the best solutions available. I recently made a new website for myself that links all of my different online presences into one central location. If you want to build a beautiful website and support the channel, then head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash techbymat to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video and now let's get on to the benchmarks. So I benchmarked a number of games varying in difficulty. Starting off with the easiest game CSGO, I played at Pro Settings 1080p in a team deathmatch game. The FPS averaged around 300 FPS overall and during combat it stayed in the upper 200s. Obviously the system's pretty overkill for CSGO but I know a lot of you like to see it benchmarked so here you go. Moving on to another highly requested game, Rust. I don't really play this. I went with the settings it defaulted me to, which is this. The overall average was around 110, and I never saw it drop below 100 FPS. If this is a game you want to see benchmarked more often, let me know in the comment section below. Moving on to Fortnite at 1080p Pro settings, the overall average was around 200 FPS, but in combat, things stayed more in the mid 100s, and I never really saw it drop below 120. Next up is PUBG at 1080p high settings. I didn't play a very long match, but in this game I got an average of around 160 FPS, and if I wasn't awful at this game then this PC would allow me to be competitive. Next up is Far Cry 5 at 1080p high settings. Using the built-in benchmark, this system produced a 110 FPS average with a low of 91. This is pretty good performance for a game like Far Cry 5. Finally, the last game tested was Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p high settings. In the built-in benchmark, this system received a 104 FPS average, which again for a AAA game like this is pretty good. Overall performance for this system is great. The R5 3600 and GTX 2060 make a good combo. If there are other games you want to see tested in the future, let me know in the comment section below. I hope this video has been helpful, informative, or entertaining. These build guides take a lot of work, but if you guys keep watching, them then I'll keep making them. So yeah guys I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did make sure to give this video a big thumbs up as well as consider subscribing for more PC and tech related content in the future. And as always this is Matt from Tech by Matt signing out.